I've been skirting around the edge of the film and music industries for most of my life. I almost got sucked in three or four times when I was younger, the last time by MTV, and I turned those offers down every single time because every time the entertainment industry offered to open a door for me, it also promised to lock it shut behind me so I could never escape. In the last few videos, I've been trying to explain to you that the Matrix is not a computer. The Matrix is not just some artificial intelligence that's trying to manipulate us. It's a network of people, like entertainers, who are being used to trick you into thinking that you're in love with your screen, or in love with a product, or in love with a piece of entertainment. But that's just one of the ways that they try to trick us into engaging with the Matrix. Celebrities are just the face of it. Singers, actors, dancers, comedians, writers. Some of the people that we love are trapped in celebrity hell. Growing up, I did not realize that my idol was Lucifer. Every one of my favorite characters from all of my favorite television shows and films were a reference to the fallen angel turned hero. The first was probably Wolverine. I was big into comics when I was a child. A Canadian smoker with trident hands who keeps dying and coming back to life, forgetting who he is and slowly remembering. And then after he was reborn as Weapon X, he turns around and destroys his creators. And then he runs off to rescue children from experiencing the same fate that he did, not once, not twice, but three times in the films. Ah, what a, what a crazy idea for a character. Then there's Dragon Ball. They did it three times with the original child Goku. He was a reference to the Monkey King. He falls from heaven and bumps his head, giving him amnesia, forgetting that his mission was to take over the Earth. He also turns around and destroys his creators, more or less, who come in the form of his own brother. And it turns out that despite his naivety and inability to fit in with humans, Goku is the most impressive of person on the earth, achieving victory after victory against all odds. The same Lucifer archetype is revisited with Piccolo later, a green man whom is technically the evil half of God, called Kami in Japanese. Piccolo physically separated from God, then fell to earth as a villain. Then our hero Goku kills him in a fight, and then Piccolo is reborn as his own son hatching from an egg with amnesia, wandering the earth trying to discover who he is, eventually adopting a life of good, protecting the earth. And then there's my favorite character in the series, Vegeta, basically does all that again, but this time with Frieza, one of the greatest characters ever written, who plays the role of Vegeta's creator and destroyer. Those characters were the closest thing that I had to a real hero or a role model growing up. But even as a child, I was very cynical about what those heroes represented. I am just old enough to remember the era of Saturday morning cartoons, when all of the toy brands produced tie-in shows to advertise their products, like Transformers, My Little Pony, G.I. Joe. Programs like that were trying to get around laws that were designed to protect protect children from corporate advertisers. See, corporations weren't allowed to just advertise their product directly to children in their television shows, nor could they allude to the product's existence. But the Transformers brand could run their ads for Transformers toys a half hour later during the G.I. Joe show, and G.I. Joe could run their ads a half hour earlier during Transformers. Part of the stipulation for creating entertainment for children is the show must contain a wholesome message and try to teach things to kids. But some shows, like G.I. Joe, were so bad at it, they would just decide to do a two-minute segment at the end of the show, hammering in a blatant message over your head in the most blunt way possible. Telling us to brush our teeth, drink milk, study hard in school, eat your vegetables, 
fuck off. I wasn't stupid. I knew I was being talked down to. I knew that those shows were just saying things they had to say, even as a child. I understood that the entire thing was corporate spin, and the only reason that those wholesome messages were in the show was because they were legally obligated to say those things. G.I. Joe had an obligation to fulfill. They didn't care if I ate carrots or not. Mr. T didn't give a f about milk. They had no choice but to say that sh It all operated as part of the trick, part of the lie to get us to invest in these different toy lines or comic books. In this way, multiple generations of children now have developed their moral compass based on the teachings of corporate America. This is the America that Captain America represents. Corporate America. Corporate morality. I'm not gonna pretend I was completely immune to it. I remember getting a lot of Ninja Turtles toys as a kid, and I did love that show and the films. But really, I was more into Hanna-Barbera, things like Scooby-Doo, those sorts of shows. I don't remember any of those programs talking down to me or advertising to me. They just offered fun stories and a good time. But then one day, a new show would pop up that would change all of that for me. A new show that actually made me want to buy the guy damn toy. A show that gave me energy. Power Rangers always felt like a guilty pleasure. Right from day one. Not just because of the toys, but because the show was corny as hell. I had just turned eight years old when the first episode aired, but I was struggling to catch it on television because they were airing the episodes right before school, like at 8 a.m. or something. And I found out about the show because all of the kids were showing up to class in the morning like they had taken crack or something. Everyone was all jazzed up, jumping around, play fighting, and they could not shut the hell up about how awesome Power Rangers was. Whatever the hell this show was, it changed everyone at my school overnight. And I was so obsessed with learning everything about the show before I even saw it. About a week into this phenomenon, I remember harassing an entire table of kids in my fourth grade class to help me by deciding describing the Megazord so I could draw it in my notebook like I was a police sketch artist investigating a f***ing murder. That's how badly I wanted to see this Megazord with my own eyes. This was the effect that this show had on me before I even saw a single second of its content. That is how I was introduced to the modern era of children's entertainment. Power Rangers turned out to be one of the cheesiest television shows ever produced. With its heavy Japanese inspiration and wholesome stories about characters and their struggles at school, but for the first time ever, we were introduced to fast-paced action with rock music, guns, swords, robots, monsters, and superheroes all at once. And again, we were watching this show before school, so it was like the entire class was demon-possessed for the first few months. And it made the parents go crazy in the news. It's wild to remember back to when entertainment changed that drastically. Looking back, I only really got invested in the first couple of seasons. And to be more specific, I only really got hooked on the show because of a single miniseries that introduced Tommy, the Green Ranger, and the master of the Dragon Zord. The Green Ranger started off evil, like Vegeta. He was created to be the right hand of a witch, the evil queen on the moon, commanding an undead army of clay dolls, Tommy was sent down to destroy the Power Rangers and take over the Earth. Wielder of electricity and sound, using his musical dagger, he summons the Dragon Zord from the deep to destroy cities. The Evil Pied Piper. Despite the fact that the show was cheesy and wholesome on the surface, and the messages of each episode were meaningful, the showrunners were clearly not sincere because they treated their own cast like they were chattel, swapping them out anytime they made the slightest
slightest complaint about their working conditions and replacing them with just some generic teenager. As long as they could continue to sell the toys of the characters in their costumes, it didn't matter to them who was actually wearing the costume on the show. Most famously, David Yost, who played the Blue Ranger, and is probably the single biggest lover of the Power Rangers out of everyone on the entire planet. Well, he struggled to remain on the show for years, being forced into a remedial role, and then eventually being written off of the show entirely. They didn't even let him record a goodbye message, they just put an image of his character up on a communication screen randomly one day, and then had someone else record shitty ADR saying, Poochie has to go back to his home planet now. That's fucking insulting. As you can imagine, the remaining cast had no sense of security for their jobs. They were never treated as important. The cast was very clearly made to feel disposable, and this was easy for the showrunners to maintain because their cast always consisted of younger adults and kids who weren't established in the entertainment industry and hadn't developed any kind of name recognition. And on top of that, the actors were expected to film upwards of 60 episodes per season. This show grinded their actors down to a fucking pulp to sell toys. In this new world of television heroes, Jason David Frank, Tommy the Green Ranger, was placed in the position of corporate role model for children. And he took up that role like a goddamned legend. To the bitter end, there were fans of the show, even guys my age, going to comic conventions to meet Tommy the Green Ranger. And this guy was so fucking incredible. He was so good with the fans. He was so charismatic and inspirational. When he interacted with everyone, he really was a role model. He really was the man that we all saw on TV as kids. But there was clearly always a disconnect between the reality of being an employee of the Power Rangers franchise, the face of a brand or a product, and the false platform of being a role model for children, a person that the fans can look up to. Unfortunately, Jason David Frank is no longer with us. Life got very hard for Jason. So Jason David Frank is no longer here. In my opinion, the entertainment industry destroyed Jason. He was set up to fail. The corporate role model is a false idol, and it was totally fucking unfair of the Power Rangers to burden him with that responsibility without equipping him with the proper tools. It was unfair of Power Rangers to push him into that position while simultaneously threatening to take his job away from him at any minute. I got thinking about Jason a few months back before he left us when I was working on the scripts for my videos on the banks and slavery in America. I posted a cheeky video on Instagram of a green man destroying America and the banks. And I, wa I wasn't even thinking. Only a few days later, it turned up in the news that he was gone. And I understood immediately what happened. I fucking knew before they even said one word. Because I was watching his steady decline over time. His transformation from being a clean-cut children's role model into a tattoo-covered ring fighter. I should have made this video years ago. I should have told you guys where I stand fucking years ago. I am so fucking sorry. Jason David Frank was easily the most influential person from my childhood. I genuinely would not be the man that I am today without his influence. He really was that man that we celebrated on the Power Rangers show in the 90s. He really was that guy. But Jason was battling demons. He was struggling. And that was showing best in his motivational videos. He was losing a fight. He was up against something he couldn't be, and he didn't know how to get over it. When he would give advice to us, it just sounded like he was defeated, and it seemed like he was alone in it, at least 
in his own head. Jason's own career ended abruptly on the Power Rangers as well. One day randomly, after like 10 episodes of a new season, they completely swapped out the entire cast for new people for no reason. After they had just used Jason David Frank's name and face to get everyone to watch that season in the fucking first place. They used him to fucking bait and switch us into Power Rangers Turbo, and then canned his ass fucking immediately. After his time as a Power Ranger ended, Jason continued to show up to all of the conventions. He still made appearances on television specials, tons of fan-made videos, internet superhero mashup stuff, and nerd culture stuff on YouTube. He was still a boss. He was still a legend. He was still our fucking champion. But he went home after each of those events feeling immense emptiness because none of that represented any kind of reality. It was all just to fulfill a bunch of fans' fantasies of seeing Tommy fight another bad guy. It didn't actually mean anything. There's no substance to this. This wasn't giving him purpose. Jason had to have been experiencing an extreme cognitive disconnect between what was expected of him by his fans and the reality of the man he was. The man into which the entertainment industry turned him. He wanted to be Tommy because we all believed he was Tommy. He tried to live up to that because that false idol that we created was the most meaningful thing in his life. And he never for one second had any control over any of that. He was always stuck inside of that role. Inside of the role that we gave him. The television show only existed to sell toys. Jason David Frank only played the role of Tommy the Green Ranger to sell us toys. He was only set up as a motivational role model because the television show was legally obligated to include those things in the story. Power Rangers was never meant to actually provide meaningful role models or messages for children. They only wanted me to buy a fucking Megazord. Jason David Frank died for a toy line. Jason David Frank was set up to fail. The Green Power Ranger was set up to fail. And we all just sat by and watched like Britney Spears. Never again. Do not hang yourself on the false corporate heroes, the actors and characters who promote your favorite makeup brand or advertise your favorite beer. I get it. It's nice having that security, that feeling of knowing that someone behind the screen is watching out for you, that someone out in the world has your best interest in mind and actually believes those values. But a real superhero, a real role model, is never going to come with a price tag.